Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mix It Up with ML, episode number 14. Um, and for any first time listeners, this podcast is all about learning from and connecting with super passionate people in their respective fields. Um, and so just a quick plug, please hit that, you know, like and subscribe button, all the other things that YouTubers say. Um, if you enjoy the content, it will really help the channel grow. So today is a really unique episode, actually, because it's the first guest that I've had um, where I've never met them in person. So I've just been admiring their work from afar. Um, and she graciously extended her time today. So Natalie Cho is a graduate student athlete for the UCLA women's basketball team. Natalie attended high school in Plano, Texas, where she was named a McDonald's All-American, uh, one of five finalists for the Morgan Wooden National Player of the Year Award, um, and also was ranked as the number eight recruit in the nation. She then attended Baylor University for two seasons before transferring to UCLA, and she is now getting her Master's of Education in Transformative Coaching and Leadership during her final year of NCAA eligibility. But goes without saying, uh, Natalie is so much more than just a basketball player. Super pumped to talk with her about her desire to impact her community, her faith journey, and more. Um, so Natalie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm such a fan of what you're doing. I'm just talking to you for like five minutes. I know you're so passionate about so many different things. So I'm really excited <laughs> for this opportunity. Wow. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. So um, any returning listeners know that we like to start the pod with a brief, you know, how we met section for myself and the guests. But again, today's a little different. Been admiring Natalie's work from afar. So I've never actually met Natalie. But the story is actually a little bit funny. Uh, so Natalie's mom trained Natalie as well as my girlfriend, Sarah, uh, back in Plano, Texas for many years um, in basketball. And so, you know, I guess roughly 12 years later or so, Sarah, I think, gave that timeline. Um, I saw Sarah playing basketball in a gym at Princeton University, which is where uh, we went to school. And I was like, whoa, this girl, you know, she's she's beautiful, but she's also a hooper. This is this is amazing. And so, you know, I fell from her there. And so one could say that Natalie's mom is partially the reason why I have a girlfriend at the moment. So this is great. <laughs> I love that. I was so glad to hear that Sarah was still balling because she was back then. So I'm glad she still is now. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So um, great. So I'd like to, you know, start most of these pods just with a little bit of background for the guests so that the listener can kind of, you know, learn more about the guest. And I know, Natalie, you've probably told this story many, many times, obviously. Um, but I'd love to, you know, just again, give our listeners some context for you know, your mom's story uh, with her basketball career and how that impacted you guys together. Um, and we can kind of go from there, like your collegiate basketball journey. And I'll just ask a bunch of questions going there, but feel free to share, you know, whatever background you like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was introduced to basketball by my mother um, and she played professionally back home, well, where she grew up um, in Beijing, China. Um, she started playing when she was around like 13 years old. Um, she was introduced to the game by a family friend, I think. So um, my grandfather, her father, um, he was like a massage person, like a masseuse or something. And so um, one day he was um, working on this coach who was just like randomly there. Um, and then my mom like walked past and walked by. And she was like, well, do you like, are you into sports? Have you played basketball before? And my mom's like, no, she's like 13 at this time. Okay. And then the lady was like, well, you just look really athletic. Like the way you walk, your physique, like you just look like you could. And my mom's like, okay. And then so she went into like a tryout and they like just tried to see like if she had potential and she had. So um, yeah, so she played, started playing professionally at a really young age. Um, and then, yeah, when she came to America, she started to be, um, she was like a skills basketball coach, like Sarah and I. That's where um, we all just like came together. Um, yeah, and that's how I ultimately was introduced to the game. Amazing, amazing. And so what age, Natalie, did your mom come to the United States and, and like sort of start that journey? And did she know like immediately, like, all right, I want to be a basketball trainer or did she kind of fall into that over time? I, I, I just wondered that. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. Maybe like late 20s, early 30s. Okay to America. Um, my dad had gotten a scholarship, an academic scholarship 
at Silomar University in Beaumont, Texas. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought my whole family here. Um, and so, yeah, so, yeah, she came here. She didn't have any connections. She barely knew the language. Um, and she didn't know anyone. She didn't know anything about this country. Um, but the one thing I love about basketball, it's just, it's universal. Um, every, everyone, well, not everyone, but, um, yeah, you can just, like, pick up a basketball anywhere and other people will start playing and stuff. So my mom, that's what she knew best. Um, it was basketball. And so, yeah, that's how she started being a skills trainer. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. And so, you know, just jumping right into it, right, I want to talk about sort of your passion for impacting your community sort of on the court first, and then we can go to off the court. But, you know, I think the statistic in, in the video, your, your feature on the Pac-12 channel, uh, is that like less than 1% of all uh, women's D1 basketball players are Asian American, right? So um, let's just talk a little bit about that, right? And I think in that feature, your mom talks about how she not used you, but had you as an example of like how she could be a really great trainer because obviously you were incredible um, and sort of like people didn't expect that then and they sure they don't expect it really now right to have an Asian American woman as a basketball trainer. Um, and so I, I'll obviously ask some questions about this part of you, but could you kind of get the ball rolling on, you know, just that rare journey of yours and, and how unique that is for yourself and your mom. Yeah, so um... Yeah, it's no secret that there's not a lot of Asian American in sports and especially um, basketball. Um, so growing up at a really young age, like when I knew Sarah, there was like a lot, there's a big Asian community um, in Plano. Okay. So I would grow up um, in like the rec leagues, PSA, um, and there'd be like a lot of Asians and that was like elementary school. Um, but then when I got into like middle school, start playing AAU, um, that's when the percentage like decreased and went down a lot um and then so it wasn't until like I made the USA basketball team um that was summer going to sophomore year where I realized like wow like there's not a lot of people that come from the same background as I do um because I was like the only Asian there and then when I made the team um, they're like you're I think you're like the first Asian American to ever make a national team and I was like wow that's that's really like I'm really honored, but that's really sad, kind of, like, it really made me, like, hmm, like, there's not a lot of people, like, going on this path, um, like I was, so, yeah, and then, um, like you said, in NCAA, like, less than 1%, uh, I don't think, I played against, like, maybe one Asian um, in my career. Wow, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, and in, uh, in my college career. Right. So that's, like, just to think, like, yeah, so, yeah. Right. <laughs> And you kind of used the word like lonely sometimes, like it was really, um, you know, you, you said you were proud of yourself, right? For the McDonald's All-American Accomplishment Team USA, but sometimes it felt a little lonely because you didn't see other people like yourself doing what you were doing. Would that be kind of accurate to say? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. When I uh, was getting like first recruited in like freshman of high school, like I didn't even realize I could get recruited and go to college for basketball because I never saw anyone who looked like me, I didn't even think that was like an option until mm. later on. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so could I ask you just a little bit about that, right? Um, and, and you guys touched on on this again in your feature documentary. For everybody who's listening, uh, definitely check it out. What is it called, Natalie? It's, it's um, what's yeah, the name? All for One. All for One. Check it out, Natalie Cho, All for One on YouTube. Beautiful 10-minute yeah. documentary. Um, I, like this is from your mom and yourself saying like, some Asian kids are not pursuing sports um, because one, they don't have society support, but also familial support can be lacking as well. Um, so I just want to touch on that because I found that to be pretty interesting because um, you also said like some of your family members told you not to focus on basketball. Um, and I guess my question would be twofold, right? Like, do you think that, I guess this is more obvious, but having role models like you can kind of help shift that narrative but also, do you think that that's enough? Uh, and if not, like, what are some other ways that we can encourage, you know, Asian kids to pursue sports, um, not as like a zero sum game, like they can pursue other things as well. Um, but do you have any thoughts on that? Just thought I'd ask. Yeah, so for me, um, like you said, like, growing up, I did have family members like why? Because my I'm really lucky that I had my mom. Um, and she was like, really passionate about basketball, because 
um, if it weren't for her, I'd probably, it'd be way harder. Um, and so, yeah, I had, like you said, a lot of, like, close friends and family members, like, why are you spending so much time? Because in the, in my culture, um, sports isn't, um, like, prioritized. It's not really important. It's just, like, a hobby. It's just something that, you know, well, it is still a hobby, but it's just something that you do um, just to get in shape and just to have fun. But um, the way, like, my mom and I looked at it, we took it really seriously. Like, this was our life. Um, it's everything that we did. So, yeah. I'm so sorry. What was the question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, no problem. I kind of got it lost in there. But I guess my question would be, um, one, do you think, like, having role models like yourself can kind of shift that narrative that, you know, other Asian families can be like, you know, it's it's okay for my, my son or daughter to, you know, pursue this further. Um, but secondly, is that enough, right? Just having one person like yourself, is that enough? And if not, like, what else can we do to encourage um, Asian, Asian Americans to pursue more sports if they want, right? They don't have to, but if they want to. Actually, yeah, I think role models are vital. Um, okay. For me, it wasn't until Jeremy Lin, um, where like, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I was obsessed. I was like, Lin Sanity, like, <laughs> every single game, like, I got, I still get really emotional for what he did um, for our community and also myself. Um, just being able to see someone um, who, like, looks like me to play in the NBA, to have such a huge splash um, in his career, that meant everything. Uh, so I really do think role models are so important. And yeah, that's what I'm trying to be. I think um, right now, like, I mean, education is just so important um, in like the Chinese community. Right. Um, and being someone like Jeremy Lin, who went to Harvard and then went to the NBA, like that means so much. And then for me, like going to UCLA, trying to get my degree, I'm so, this, my dog, Bay. stop. <laughs> no, we love dogs. All good. All good. Oh, she's like. <laughs> so, um, what kind of dog do you now. have, Natalie? Yeah. Um, she's just like, she's my best friend. Oh, so cute. Like, yeah, she, we've just been like attached at the hip since I've been home and she's like been really. Okay. No I'm, worries at all. I'm going to just put her right here. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, role, yeah. Models are really... role models are important. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, role models are really important. Um, and is that enough? Um, I think that it's a start, but um, it definitely starts with like, this, it's really hard. Like for me, like a lot of, there are a lot of stereotypes um, that people labeled me um, growing up until I like made a name for myself and like society, like that was really hard just to get through um, because like society says that we can't like Asians can't play sports at a high level. And so trying to break through that barrier um, was pretty hard. Um, so yeah, just changing the whole stereotype that Asians can't play. Um, but for me, I really had amazing role models, um, like my mom and also Jason Terry. He was my AAU coach, just helping me along the way um, was really important too. Absolutely. And, and one thing I kind of pulled out there, do you think one way to try to shift the narrative is, is also looking at sports as a way to, you know, like you said, get a free education as well um, is a beautiful thing just to remember that, right? Because uh, you're getting a degree from an amazing school, you know, um, and you're playing basketball, right? So you can do both and hopefully just trying to shift that narrative a little bit more. Really the best of both worlds. Right. Um, being able to like get a free education and play at the highest level. Um, I think it's such a great like opportunity. Um, you get like a, free, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. And so sort of, leading right from, from what you just said, um, you know, people telling you that you can't do it and everything. And, and I know I, I heard this on some of your other podcasts, like Jason Terry was a big role model for yourself and, and your mom as well to, you know, rise above that. And so I know role models are important, but were there any other ways, like sort of on a specific level, right, that you were able to block out that negativity or hear it and rise above it? Like for our listeners who might be dealing with like similar things, people telling them they can't do it. Is there anything that you think of in your mind back to that time, like specific strategies you sort of employed to sort of like get through that period? Because I can't imagine that was easy and that you just got through it sort of, you know, non-intentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, I don't know about strategies, but I right. just love it. Um, it's like everything that I did. I watched it like 24-7. I practiced with my mom all the time. I played it like I just loved it so much and it was like one of those things that I like I was really passionate about as a kid 
Um, and so I knew like I wasn't gonna give that up um, just because some people um, were like being negative. But like for me also, like I was gonna show them like I'm gonna prove to them that they're wrong. And right. That's like the competitive side of me, like showing them that they don't know what they're talking about and just continuing to push for my dreams and what I'm really passionate about. Yes. And so that brings up an interesting point, Natalie. Like, I, I think I've even asked one of my previous guests about this, like, you know, Kobe, MJ did things like that, like turning, you know, criticism into fuel and motivation. Like, do you think, cause sometimes I wonder, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, I don't know if I want to be motivated for those reasons, but there's sort of like an irresistible, you know, real strength out of that, that can really, like in your case, it seems like really motivate people to achieve great things. Like, what are your thoughts on using criticism sort of as a motivator? Um, yeah. It's like, I mean, I do get my motivation from so many different things, but definitely criticism, um, just like to prove people wrong. That's like the most, like the best, like when you are able to like look back and be like, hmm, like you're wrong. And like, y'all doubt everyone doubted me and stuff like that's the best um just right. being able, and then yeah i i love criticism as a motivation as motivation yeah and and i think you can kind of look at it as like it's you're, you're proving people wrong but it's it's more like also you're proving to yourself you know things right and just viewing it as a positive of like i'm gonna let these people's criticism motivate me but it's not like i'm they're they're like taking up all this headspace in me right like I'm sure that's not the case for you. Like, you're not worried about these detractors, but you're saying, okay, they said something like, let me fuel, like, let that fuel me to achieve great things for me, not for anybody else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you could tell I'm a psychology major, so I love this kind of stuff, but <laughs> yeah. Great. So one more mental question. I have another mental question for you, like sort of your approach. Um, right. So we talked about this, you're, you know, one of if not the only asian american females to be playing at like your level in the college in the college game um right so and you're blazing a trail nobody else is taking before um and you've also for the listeners natalie's been very outspoken about trying to be um an inspiration to to younger asian kids both boys and girls right so i feel like there's always a spotlight on you for that reason right and you and you kind of brought it up on yourself because you want to inspire others um do you ever have moments where you want to take your yourself out of that spotlight and you think, you know, I wish I wasn't the only one doing this and I wish this wasn't, you know, something I have to carry all the time. Um, and do you ever feel like it's added stress and pressure on your performances? Like, I know you said on like one of the Asian heritage nights, you were super nervous about that night because you don't want to disappoint yeah. people. Like, and if so, like, how do you respond in that moment? How do you keep yourself going mm -hmm. and carrying this, you know, it's not a burden, but just this, this weight that's on you and, but you're using it to inspire others. Does that make sense? That question? Yeah. So yeah, two um, examples came up and you had kind of um, referred to one of them. So yeah, um, when there was a, like, when we were allowed to play in front of a crowd and before COVID um, that one season, um, UCLA, the women's program had like, and it's never happened to me, like a program's never done that for me, like an API heritage game and so that meant a lot to me um and so in the la area there's just a, a huge asian american community and so they um the like staff like everyone invited like all these little kids who play basketball um like the asian community like everyone we had a like little asian girl singing the national anthem um in the uh, halftime show we had like an asian dance group and that just meant so much to me because I, like no one's ever done that done that for me um, so yeah, I was really nervous when I was warming up um, and just seeing like all the Asian kids coming in. Like I got really nervous. I like started shaking like, and then like uh, when we were warming up and then like I had to go over to my, I think my assistant coach. I was like, can you please pray for me? Like I don't, I'm just being, I'm like, I sometimes deal with like anxiety and stuff, but this was like a really prime time. And I was like, can you just pray for me? Um, I'm just like feeling really anxious. I definitely don't want to let all these people down um, and I just want to be a great example and a great representation for all of them and so we prayed and I just felt a lot better and then they told me like they they already like they're not you don't need to prove anything else mm. you're, you're gonna watch and enjoy and just relax and that's like so that was really helpful um so that yeah that was one example where I was a little I got a little anxious 
Um, but, um, but I think I did play well that game, so I'm really happy about that. Um, and then so another example um, would be like a couple months ago, um, before March Madness, um, when um, so over like the past couple, the past two years, I've been kind of um, like outspoken about um, what's going on in my community um, regarding racism and like the rhetoric used to describe COVID-19. Um, yep. Yeah, I like, so um, it kind of died down. And then um, right before March Madness this past season, um, there was like a huge increase in, rape, um, in hate crimes towards Asian Americans all across the country and also the world. Um, and then uh, I've got a lot of like DMs and messages asking like, why aren't you speaking up about this? Cause I mm. had before um, and I was just like, I got really stressed. I was like, I can't like, cause I was like in the middle of finals, we were preparing for March Madness. And then I was like really worried about my family and also my community. And then I had a lot of messages like, you spoke up about it before, why are you speaking up about it now? Like, it's kind of disappointing that you're not speaking out. And like, I really felt like I was the only one speaking up about it and why are people expecting me to? Um, so I did feel a lot of pressure about that, but I did talk to um, my assistant coach, Coach Tasha. Um, she's very passionate about this kind of stuff. So she definitely helped me through that. Right, mm -hmm. right. So it sounds like, you know, firstly, you were just kind of remembering that, right? Like the fans weren't there for that night specifically. It's not like you had to prove something to them. It's like, you, you've already, you're there and that's what matters, right? And just sort of remembering that I think is, is really powerful. And then, yeah, it sounds like you had so much going on in your life personally, right? And then you were like, people were asking you to sort of advocate for others out there. So it's like kind of tough to balance both those things, but I'm glad you have that support system. And yeah, I was just interested to see, you know, sort of how that approach, what approach you take to that stuff. So thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then sort of lastly, um just want to touch on like the mother daughter combination right like your mom and yourself and coach Corey Close I believe her name is at UCLA mm -hmm. I was just talking about how rare that is for her like she would know I wouldn't know like on the recruiting trail just how mm -hmm. rare it is to see like a, a mother daughter combination um and you also say like and this is pretty beautiful like you realize towards the end that your mom was sort of that role model that you never had right and that that's really powerful um I just wanted to ask you like one, why do you think that mother daughter combo is so rare? Um, is it, is it the obvious thing that maybe moms just have not been encouraged to pursue sports or be involved in sports? Is it something else? And then to like, what has been the most special part of your bond with your mom? Would you say? So for the first question, I have no idea. I just know, like, I'm just so lucky that my mother um, played and is really passionate about teaching and, so like my whole life, I've just been under her learning from her. Um, but yeah, I have no idea why that mother, I thought it, that's a great question. I have like been on like panels and stuff where that like other people were also mother and daughter, but yeah, there's not a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and what was the second question? Second question is like, what has been the most special part of that bond for you? Like just being with your mom, if you had to pick like one thing. Oh man, there's, yeah. Um, I mean, our relationship is like kind of surrounded by basketball. Um, and so just being able to just like spend so much time with her, like on the court, like just learning from her as a coach and seeing another side of her, um, I think is like awesome for me. Um, yeah, like sometimes when I was younger, it would come back home and like she'd get on me after like a practice or a game. But now like looking back, I'm really grateful for those times because our relationship just like got way more deeper because she was my mother. She was my coach. She was my trainer. She was like everything. So um, I'm de we are definitely really close because of that. That's beautiful. And do you feel like um, you've been able to, is it still like, obviously it's still going to be focused on basketball, but do you feel like there's other parts of you guys' relationship that you're able to share, like sort of outside of that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, especially since I, I've been at UCLA and I've been like, it's, growing more and more as a person um I've definitely like ventured out into other things that I'm really open to um but yeah my mom and I like we're really we're, we're really strong in our faith and we always talk about that um we've been doing like bible studies together um and just spending time together and she's like teaching me how to cook and stuff so it's great yeah there you go 
That's great. Two things I want to ask you about that you just mentioned later, um, like the things you're interested in outside of basketball. I want to ask you that, uh, but then also your faith walk. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, but now sort of moving on, um, you've been, you know, advocating for your community on the court, right? Trying to be a role model for, for other, you know, hopeful Asian athletes, um, but off the court as well, as you just touched on. Um, and you've also set out growing up sort of Chinese culture values, obedience and, and like deference to authority. Um, and that was a huge part of your value system. Um, but then you chose um, and continue to do so to speak out on anti-Asian hate um, and talk about things like you guys are not the model minority and, and rhetoric like that. Um, what was the step of speaking out like for you, especially considering what we just said about, you know, how important obedience is and, and deference to authority? Uh, what does your mom think about it? What does your family think? Um, obviously, you don't have to share if you're not comfortable, but I just thought I'd, you know, ask if, if you were willing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm just like really grateful for UCLA and the whole, like also the basketball program, but also just like the education system, because I've just learned so much um, being there. I, I'm like a sociology major. So just like learning about all that kind of stuff was really important and vital to my growth and my journey. And so, yeah, um, back last year in March, um, that's when like um, people started using like Chinese virus, Kung Fu um, and that kind of stuff. And back then I didn't really see like a lot of people speaking up about it. Um, and so I was like, hmm, like, this is actually like really dangerous and this is like really bad. It can turn into like something terrible. So um, I was like talking to my sister, um, Ting Ting and she's, her and I are completely different. She's very outspoken and I'm like the quiet one. Okay. Like, Ting, like what, like, do you think I should say something about this? Cause like no one else was. And she's like, yes, you should. Like you have a platform. I'm like, okay, like what should I say? And she's like, you will write it and I can edit it. And I was like, okay. So like I composed a tweet. Yeah. Um, just talking about my experience and like what I'm worried about. And just like, I just want to get the message across of what was happening to my community. Um, and so like I had, I was really like hesitant. It took me like it was like a small paragraph, but like it took me like hours to write. I was like, everything has to be perfect. I had like five people um, like revise it and edit it and like just try to make it as great as possible. Um, I was like, okay, I'm going to tweet it. And she's like, okay, do it. And so I tweeted it. And like I threw my phone away and I didn't look at it. Didn't look at it. Yeah. It was like, because I'm like not someone who likes to ruffle the feathers or anything or cause anything. Same. Yeah, so I was like, just like really like, worried about that um but um yeah so that happened and then so yeah and then I continue to talk about it um, and I think that the example from like my black teammates and also my black coaches and my role models um are just so great um because they like they've been really outspoken about um the injustices and racism and prejudices that they see um in their lives and so just learning from them um and taking their example, um, I've really learned how to like really love myself um, in that way. So yeah. Yeah, and, and that's beautiful. And so it sounds like your sister was really supportive, but like, did you have any sort of, you know, like, was it all support from your Asian community and your Asian friends and everything, and, and maybe some of your older family members or anything, or was it was it tough um, familiarly? Was it hard? So like for my mom, I was like, we were trying to explain to her what Twitter was and what this meant. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay, like, whatever you think is good, just keep doing it. I was like, okay. Uh, but I did have some, like, some close people, like, why would you, like, they were just, like, scared for me, like, for my safety or something. And they're, like, I, like, we had talked about earlier, like, in the culture, you don't want to ruffle any feathers, you kind of want to stay low. And so they're, like, they're just kind of worried about my safety um, and, like, why did you do that and kind of stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can imagine that was hard, but. I'm glad that that you did it. Um, you know, at least personally, I'm glad. So uh, excited that you're you're speaking out on these things. Um, and so, just for a little bit of education, like for myself and for our our listeners as well, um, if they're interested, is like, can we touch on some misconceptions that are sort of driven by the model minority myth? I know you're a sociology major. You're sort of into this stuff, but um, I was reading about it as well. Just the idea that it, it drives this myth that um, Asian Americans are, are like fairly represented in leadership positions when that's not really the case. Um, 
things like all of Asian Americans are high earning and well-educated, things like that. Can we just touch on some of that stuff? And I'd love to learn more from you about that. And, and yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you hit it spot on. It's just like, we're like the model minority who um, never like causes any trouble, just does what we need to do and continue to climb that, that ladder, that um, social ladder or economic ladder, um, just like quietly and not ruffling any feathers. But yeah, that, you basically um, put it like was you're basically correct. Um, yeah. But, you know, like I've been really struggling with the whole term like model minority because mm. it wasn't until recent, like you had said, that I realized how detrimental this label is. Um, I think growing up um, and like even in college when I was at Baylor, I really hid behind the model minority label um, because I am like an introvert. I am really quiet. I'm like, okay, like, well, people don't expect me to be loud and people don't expect me to talk um, like the moral minority. They don't expect me to um, create any like arguments or anything. So I really did hide behind that. Uh, but then just seeing, um, yeah, like how of a privilege that is to be able to hide behind that label. I just like just began to realize how like not great that was. And so yeah. trying to go against um, the whole model minority label, um, and it's been, like, it's really taking me out of my comfort zone, um, but I'm really working on it and growing in that. It's so interesting you say that, like, definitely um, can see what you mean, and I think it's curious to me, right, because the term, like, it, it, it has that positive connotation, right, but obviously, like, that's to sort of, it's sort of a racial wedge to sort of draw, like, between Blacks and Asians, um, mm -hmm. right, but um, I think it's, it's just interesting. What was I going to say about? Oh, yeah. So it's, it's interesting because like, it's a positive connotation. But then like you said, you could sort of hide behind it and sort of like let it put you in a box, mm -hmm. which is an interesting thing. Um, and like, let it decide like how you're going to act and how you're going to be so um, and maybe that's sort of the purpose of it, I guess it like sort of surreptitiously is, is a very um, you know, I guess, loaded term in that way and detrimental, even with a positive connotation. And I've never really thought about that deeply until, you know, as I was prepping for this pod. So yeah, would you agree with that? Absolutely. It like, comes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. That, yes. Like, I'm a minority. But now, like the past couple of years, like, no, I'm not like I I'm going to like speak out against what I think is correct, like what is right. And, like, I'm going to make people uncomfortable. And that's what I need to do. Um, to like fully love myself and to educate others and to love others. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think, uh, like, where do you think the status of this um, relationship between Asian Americans and this term um, is right now in America? Have you, do you feel like you've seen some progress over, you know, 10 years, one year, five year, whatever period you've sort of been looking at it? Like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on where it stands currently? Yeah, I think um, people are in my community are, feeling more towards to like how I'm feeling about it like I um the couple of like Instagram pages that I follow like they're really against using the model minority and just kind of okay like label um and so I like that I do see progress so that's good yeah 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 absolutely absolutely um and now kind of moving on um on this the on this theme of being outspoken right you've been outspoken um in all these other areas of your life trying to inspire you know young Asian athletes as well as your community off the court. Um, but then on the other hand, um, you know, I, because you're outspoken, I'm not surprised by this, but I also am surprised by just how outspoken you are about your faith as well. Uh, because I think that's fairly uncommon, uh, especially among athletes, you know, at least recently, I guess it's more uncommon. Um, and so you mentioned that your mom kind of raised you in your faith as well. It's been a big part of your family. Could you just talk a little bit about your faith background? And then I have just, you know, one or two questions about it because it's, it's inspiring to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think just like having athletes who, like Jeremy Lin, he's very, very rooted in his faith and he makes it very known. And that like, just like him being able to do that gives me a lot of courage and like a guide. Um, but yeah, so I've been like a Christian, a believer like my whole life. Um, but, but it wasn't until like I got into college where I really, um, had a deeper relationship with um, the Lord. Um, like when I was beginning to, like the whole process of transferring, um, that just like opened a new door to our relationship. Um, and I'm like 
really grateful for the friends that I did have at Gaelic. Um, they were all really strong believers. Um, shout out to Val. Um, she really helped me um, with the whole process and just leaning on and just being able to lean on God um, in that whole unknown, like not knowing where I would end up um, and like ending up at my dream school, UCLA, um, just really revealed how good God is and how, um, yeah, how good he is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I also wanted to ask you about that. I didn't know where it would come up in the conversation, right, in all these different things, but like, you know, transferring from Baylor, right, you you grew up in Texas, and then Baylor's, you know, sort of, you know, one of the flag, there's a lot of Texas universities, but it's one of the flagship, you know, athletic universities. Um, so I imagine that was pretty cool to go there, but then you transferred. Uh, yeah. What was that? Ex- you, you mentioned your faith sort of got you through that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that experience? And, and because I haven't heard you talk about that much on, on some of your previous podcasts. So I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. So I, yeah, like you said, I went to Baylor. It's like two hours away, two hour drive away from I grew up and I live. Um, so that was the main factor of why I went to Baylor. Um, close to home, I think I was a little bit more immature back then. I didn't, oh, and I'm also really close to my family. I didn't want to um, yeah. be too far. And also, I wasn't ready to be on my own. Um, I remember freshman sophomore year every like almost every weekend I drove back home to work out with my mom and hang out uh, with my dog and stuff so I think I chose um Baylor because of that and also the I mean Baylor is just the women's basketball program it's just it's been historically really great um I just wanted to yeah I think my mind was on basketball um that's like that was my like I was just thinking about basketball and what um not about like my education or anything else. Um, so yeah, that's why I chose um, Baylor. Not, Baylor's a really great education school. I just like basketball was my huge, like was my main focus. Um, and then so I played there for two years, uh, for two seasons. And then I just realized that I just needed a different environment. Um, and so yeah, I decided to transfer. Um, and um, UCLA had always been like on my mind because um, it really did come down to Baylor and UCLA um, and the first time around. And so, oh, really? Um, yeah, I always kept up with UCLA and followed their plays and stuff. And I just saw that um, they're just like the culture there was totally different and something that I think I really needed. Um, and so, yeah, I transferred um, and here we are today, six years in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Getting all that eligibility out, as you yeah. should, honestly, <laughs> as you should. Um, gotcha. So, Right. You sort of touched on you, you mentioned that your faith was like deepened when you had, I guess, a lot more uncertainty about where you're going to be and everything. Um, and so what what sort of things do you do to, like, uh, I guess, cultivate that faith? And, and, and like, how do, how were you able to rest in that uncertainty and that change? It was probably a very turbulent period of your life. Yeah, so at that time, I just remember like Val just coming in and always praying with me. She was my roommate, so it was like really hard, um, but she was like, let me pray for you. And like through the whole process, she was there with me. Um, And I remember um, her sharing a scripture that I have no idea why I had no idea what it was before. (laughs) Um, It was just like seasons of life and there's a season of life for everything. Um, And she shared that with me and that just like really changed my perspective on the season of life that I was in and the season of life I was going to embark on. Um, and so, yeah, it was just really leaning on Val, Valerie. Um, and like, I'm really grateful for her and what she's done for me. So that was what really helped me through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is that verse, I think like in Ecclesiastes, like a, a time for a time for weeping, a time for sewing, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. And like, have you ever, had maybe it was during that time but have you ever had a time when you really like doubted your faith or things were like pretty uncertain or you didn't feel as connected to God for example um and if so how did you kind of get through that situation I think my first couple of years in college um at Baylor specifically was really hard um mentally physically like definitely spiritually and emotionally so all all of them it was yeah. just hard. same here same here in college <laughs> yeah that was I think like, I mean, like you said, like you were too. So freshman, that that transition is just really hard. Um, and I don't think that I was really deeply that rooted into my faith um, enough. And so I was just like on a roller coaster, like up and down, up and down in all the spectrums. 
Um, and so, yeah, that was definitely a time where I felt like I definitely could have gotten closer to God and just leaned on him. Um, but unfortunately, I, I wasn't. And then, um, yeah, so that would be like freshman, sophomore year at Baylor was really hard. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And I, I bet people can relate to that. So it's, it's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, because it's, you know, the, the faith journey is, I feel like, not supposed to be doubt free, or, you know, difficulty free, right? It's, it's part of the journey. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and like, the last part about faith is like, do you feel that it intersects, right, with basketball, being a political and community advocate? Um, and if so, how, how does it intersect for you? Do you feel like it's sort of separated from all of that? Or do you feel like it, it's sort of integrated? Oh, it's always integrated. They, my, like, the, my relationship with um, the Lord is always, it's in everything, it's rooted in everything, um, and so, like, for basketball-wise, um, growing up, I did put a lot of pressure on myself um, to perform, and just, I always, like, cared about my stats, about my rankings, about where I was, it was, it, it was terrible, um, but now, like, at UCLA, um, I'm really lucky because the UCLA women's basketball staff, they're, like, all believers, really strong believers, and they're never going to force anything on me, but if you do go in and ask, like, they'll help me, and they've been really great mentors in my faith, um, as long as other things, um, but yeah, like, at UCLA, I've really learned, like, so after every single practice, we write, my value doesn't come from what I do, my value comes from who I am, not what I do, right, like, who I am is a child of God, uh, and basketball is just something I do, so I've really been able to grow in that, and not really care about my performance because at the end of the day, God will love me no matter what I do. And so that's been really helpful um, these past couple of years. But and like speaking out um, about um, like the racism and everything that's going on in my community, I'm just using like the example of Jesus and how he always stood for what he thought was right. Um, and he was never scared to um, stir the pot or ruffle feathers. And so using his example. I love it. I love it. It's an inspiration, Natalie. So thanks for sharing that stuff and uh, keep being you because we definitely need that voice for sure. Um, I guess we're wrapping up here. We have a few more minutes. Um, and so I guess I wanted to ask you a few questions about going forward. Um, firstly, are you hoping to play professionally? Like, do you have any thoughts of, you know, what's beyond this year? Or are you just kind of focus on this year for now? Um, I, I want to play professionally. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's been a dream of mine um, since I was like, when I, when I was really young. And so I definitely want to play um, in the WNBA or overseas, whatever um, my path leads me, wherever God wants me. Um, yep. Yeah, definitely would love to play professionally. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and then, you know, you are currently getting, as we talked about, like that master's in education uh, in transformative coaching and leadership. Uh, could you talk about like, you know, what motivated you to pursue that? um and any thoughts on like how you would use that going forward do you want to hopefully be a coach someday like after basketball like any you don't have to know but just any thoughts on that yeah um it's definitely an option um that I would love to like go into um coaching I think the coaches that I've had in my life um from AAU from my mom to college have been so transformative in my life um and just I like I think I there's nothing better than to be like a coach, you know, just to be able to um, help and walk alongside like young people. So I would love to be a coach, um, maybe like at the collegiate level. I just honestly love to stay in the game because yeah. like I said, like way before, like basketball is like not all I know, but it's just something that I'm really passionate about. And I would love to stay in it for as long as I can. So through any facet, like a coach um, would be amazing. And so, yeah, I am in transformative coaching and leadership. And in that program, we just learn about um, different coaching philosophies and that kind of stuff and building our own. So I would love to. Yeah. yeah, I feel like being a coach is such a beautiful thing, right? Because you can, at least I saw this with my high school coach, like he'd been there. Honestly, it must be around like 20 plus years that he'd been coaching at my high school and just all the people he's impacted and the community really, this is just at the high school level, right? Like the community really rallies around a team and I, I it's even at a larger scale in college. So I think it would be so cool. I, I, I feel like maybe I want to coach like a rec league because, uh, you know, like I don't think I could get to high school or college level um, being being a doctor. But um, <laughs> like I think I think coaching is awesome. So like what sort of have you have you taken any of those masters in uh, coaching and leadership classes yet? Or are you not? Have you like what's that been like? Oh, I'm interested. Sure. 
it's been amazing. Yeah. Um, so, like one of my favorite classes I'm in, well, I just finished this past quarter. Um, it's just like going into other like legendary coaching philosophies. I don't know if like, so we had a lot, we, every, every single week we um, studied like a legendary coach. Wow. And then we had like um, guest speakers come in and talk to us about them. So on Phil Jackson, we learned about Phil Jackson. We had Derek Fisher, who himself is a coach in the WNBA, talk to us. Um, we would just study like all the greats who had like very different philosophies. Like we had Phil Jackson, we had John Wooden, and then we had like Bobby Knight, who's just like really different, and like Belichick and Saban. It was like really cool. And my professor was actually Miss Val, who's the legendary um, UCLA gymnastics coach. Wow. Does have the tired and so she was amazing and so just being able to learn from different philosophies and what I think works and um, would work for my personality for the future was just like so priceless yeah because yeah. I think like you, you touched on it, philosophy and like psychology and honestly I think my coach is what got me interested in psychology because he was such a master of um, reading different players psyches and how to treat each individual player right yeah. and so there's a lot of psychology and philosophy like I'm super into meditation and stuff like that. And I know Phil Jackson brought that to the Lakers and, and the Bulls and everything. So I think is what's beautiful about coaching is you can bring so many different fields and, and things into that one, you know, pursuit of a championship. You can really mix a lot in there. So I'm excited for you to learn more about that. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. And that's so great that you had a coach like that because I know a lot of coaches don't change. Um, they're very like, with um, every single one of the players. So I'm really happy that you had that experience. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, I'll be rooting for you, you know, to make it professionally and then coaching as well. Um, and I guess my last question for you is, you touched on this briefly earlier, but like, what do you like to do outside of basketball and community advocacy and, and your faith walk? Like, I know it's a lot, right? That's a lot right there, but any other, you know, hobbies or things you enjoy? I know you like hanging with your dog, but. Yeah, my dog. Um, I love, I think LA is perfect for it. Just like adventuring around and doing different things. Um, especially like during the summer now that we'll have more time off. I'm, I'm going to be like traveling to all the places in California. I'm so excited. And just being able to like um, hike, go to the beach, just explore different parts um, of the world. That's what I'm really looking forward to. So yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, you know, I've literally only been to LA and San Diego for like a week total. I, I was amazing, but I was bummed I had to leave. Do you have any recommend? I want to go see like the Redwoods in Northern California and do all that stuff. Like, do you have any recommendations for like places I should hit up? Okay. Lake Tahoe. For Lake sure. Tahoe. Let me write this down. Yeah. I have, look, I have a whole list of the places that I'm going to go. So let me just, so recently, um, <laughs> My teammate and I, Emily, went to, um, sorry, we went to Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree. Desert vibes, if you like that. Hikes, cool rocks, if you like yeah. that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, always, I always recommend Malibu. Um, really pretty. Um, beautiful sunsets. Amazing. Um, and then... Yeah, I recently went to Big Bear a couple of weeks ago. It's like a big bear lake in the middle of the mountains, and it's beautiful. The drive up there is amazing. Um, but yeah, I have a whole list. So you let me know if yeah. you have any questions, because I'm trying to make my way through all of this. So, yeah. I love that list. Now, I might even ask you for that list if you're willing to even share your secrets, honestly. I wrote down those four things. Um, and like anywhere in Texas, Natalie, if I'm ever back there, because I probably will be one or two times yeah anywhere in texas um, <laughs> <laughs> um like city is that what like i mean you said you've already been to austin i've been to austin any other like parks or anything that you've loved there <laughs> um you know i'm putting I, you on the spot here i think it's the people that really make the people <laughs> it is and the food the food's pretty good but definitely the people um that you meet um is just what makes Texas um special <laughs> gotcha gotcha I love it I love the answer um well I mean Natalie this was absolute pleasure absolute joy thank you for sharing your time I know we've never met you know you're giving me your time and it's really generous um I know I'm inspired by you and I hope our listeners can be as well 
Um, so thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the platform that you have and the way you're sharing it is just so inspirational. So I really appreciate your time and your amazing questions because they were they were great. They were really oh, good. I thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm a novice just trying my best. And so it's it's great to hear that you thought they were at least decent. So yeah, you have you have a, a you have like a future in broadcast <laughs> interviewing if you don't want to be a doctor. So <laughs> that, you're all set. That's yeah. it. it. It might happen. It might happen. But yeah, thank you again, Natalie, to the listeners. If you made it this far, thank you. And good afternoon. Good night. Peace.